Good afternoon. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, this is our inaugural event for the John H. Schneider Center for Free Enterprise. I'm Steve Goldman. I'm the director of the center. And it um, looks like we need a bigger auditorium, which is OK. Uh, anyhow, the mission of the center is to engage in research and teaching that explores the role of enterprise and entrepreneurship on advancing well-being. So engaging students in ideas may be the most important thing we do at universities. And I'm glad the center can be part of this. You guys should take advantage of all these events for the center, but all the events at the university to engage in these ideas. I think it's very important. So I'm going to do a little house cleaning first, advertising. We have lots of events planned for the upcoming year. Our next one is only two weeks away. On Wednesday, October 14th, 6 o'clock, here in the auditorium, we're going to have um, a debate where the question is resolved. <coughs> All immigration should be drastically reduced. And we have two great debaters on both sides of this issue. Mark Corian is the executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies. And Alex Noresta is from the Cato Institute Center for Global Prosperity. And I think, but I'm not sure, there will probably be pizza afterwards. <laughs> and so I hope that all of you will be able to attend, these students. <laughs> also, I want to make a plug for our undergraduate students to consider economics as a major. So a lot of you probably have some economics classes. You can pursue a BS in economics, which is the business degree side, and take all the corresponding business classes. Or you can do a BA degree and take all the arts and sciences requirements and do even a co-major like with political science. And so you can, you know, taking an economics degree is a great thing to do. Either way, you're going to have very marketable skills. Economics is pretty much everywhere. So the center will give you students lots of opportunities to participate in reading groups. We've already started one for the fall. There'll be one in the spring. Events like this, money to attend conferences. I'll be posting announcements, or the center will be posting announcements and sending emails. So take advantage of these things. And um, it will greatly enhance your opportunities and in the business world and in life. It'll open your minds. So I want to thank the John Schneider Family Foundation for making the center possible, particularly John and Annette Schneider. John started from making pizzas in a broom, broom closet at his father's bar and through free enterprise has gone from this broom closet to create nearly 4,800 stores in 38 countries with over 110,000 employees, think about that, from a room closet, and sales over $3.5 billion. This has benefits to consumers, and great pizza, producers, the workers, the stockholders, the suppliers, everybody benefits from free enterprise. True free enterprise like John's happens without cronyism, without corporate welfare. Good businesses don't need to make backroom deals with the government to get special tax exemptions, special privileges. They do it because they have products we want to buy. And that's what the center's about. I'm glad to be part of it. So the reason we're here today is to listen to Jonathan Hyde. Jonathan's the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at New York University's Stern School of Business. He received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1992. His research examines the intuitive foundations of morality politics, and religion. He's currently applying his research on moral psychology to address several questions about business, including why do people on the left and right see capitalism, business, and economics so differently? And how can companies structure and run themselves in ways that will be resistant, resistant to ethical failures? Think about Volkswagen. So John is the author of A Happiness Hypothesis and the New York Times bestseller, The Righteous Mind, why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Our reading group read that book last year. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. And by the way, he will be signing copies of it after his talk today. Uh, he's currently writing a book called Three Stories About Capitalism, The Moral Psychology of Economic Life. So without further ado, I wish to introduce Jonathan, introduce Jonathan Hyde. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. And thanks for the, uh, for the warm welcome that I've already gotten from many uh, Louisville students. 
and faculty, and I'm very pleased to be the inaugural speaker at the, uh, the Schnatter uh, Center for the Study of Capitalism. Um, we, you know, we live in capitalism like fish live in water, but as I'll, as I'll show you, I mean, I didn't really know anything about capitalism until I was 48, and I happened to you know, fall into a business school and, and like, you know, it was forced to learn about it. And, and what I've learned has really changed so much about, about what I think. And um, so it's just thrilling to find out that there is this new center uh, here at the University of Louisville. I think it's the most important thing that, um, well, Americans need to know about, but you know, people in all countries that are developing, that are competing with other countries, that are trying to become excellent. We all need to understand this system uh, that creates the world that we live uh, and grow and thrive and compete in. So today I'm gonna tell you about um, some, of the things, well, some of the things I'm thinking, some of the things I'm learning by combining moral psychology, which is my own field, with the study of capitalism. So as Steve said, um, my new book, I just made up this cover last night, this is not the real cover, because the, <laughs> cause the date is 2018, so this is the book that I'm currently um, writing, and what I'll, uh, what I'll tell you today is uh, uh, from one of the chapters of it. Um, but as Steve mentioned, I wrote two other books, and these turn out to be the backstory to this book. Even though I never thought about capitalism before a couple of years ago, I did a lot of pre-thinking. My first book was about ancient wisdom um, and uh, about what the ancients got right and what we can learn about the kind of life that, is, that, that allows humans to flourish in a variety of ways. And it turns out that capitalism creates conditions, certainly in the realm of good work or in the realm of engagement with each other and with projects, um, so capitalism does, I'll, I'll address the issue of happiness and flourishing uh, in a capitalist system. Um, then my second book was The Righteous Mind, and this was really on my own research on moral psychology and uh, um, how, uh, actually both books talk about how we basically evolved to be manipulative hypocrites. We are really, really good at self-presentation, uh, at being members of a team that's fighting another team and this is nowhere so clear as it is in American politics, increasingly so over the last 10 or 15 years. So that's what I was studying. I came to write this book on moral psychology and how left and right are just battling it out in, in ever more bitter ways. And um, as I was finishing the book, in the last uh, couple of years, my second child was born and I wasn't making much progress on writing the book and I just said, you know, I've gotta just put everything into, into this. I've gotta really go for it on this book, I'm gonna just get out of my teaching at UVA. I was at the University of Virginia for 16 years. I've gotta just stop teaching because I just don't have the time to do everything. I'm gonna to move to New York um, so to, to finish the book and be there when, uh, when the book comes out because I, I knew I couldn't travel from Charlottesville with two little kids at home. And so I brought my family to New York City. Um, <clears throat> in 2011, July 2011, we moved to New York just for a year. Um, I had no interest in business or capitalism, but um, the only place that would actually um, pay for me enough, pay me enough to live in New York was the business school. So I thought, great, I'll, I'll get a job. I'd, I'd given a talk at Stern once and I knew people there. So I said, hey, you know, to the head of the, business, of the ethics area, can I spend a year in, at Stern and teach business ethics? And, and Bruce Buchanan, the head of the business and society program said, sure, come on up. So I uh, moved up to Stern, uh, set up there and Bruce and I taught a course on business ethics. And in teaching this course on business ethics, you go through issue after issue, area after area, where, um, employ, where business people do terrible things. Um, raise your hand if you're a business student in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so most of this, yeah, more than half of the audience here is business students. You guys are going into some in really challenging situations. There are gonna be all kinds of pressures put on you uh, to make short-term deadlines, to cut corners, to do things that could end up blowing up the company as we see uh, possibly with the Volkswagen. So it's just issue after issue of, of bad ethics and case studies of bad ethics in business. And one particular day, Bruce and I are teaching, and I just couldn't believe it. Like I look at the New York Times business section and here are the stories on the front page. You know, insider case linked to a professor. So insider trading, a scientist, uh, USB, uh, UBS rogue trader, Madoff's lawyer, and then down at the bottom of the page is another article. So four out of the six articles are about businessmen behaving badly. And like, oh my God, this is just terrible. And look at the date, Sunday, September 17th. I mean, uh, Saturday, September 17th. I'm sure you don't know this. It's not like a date that 
you know, people know is famous, but that is actually the first day of Occupy Wall Street. That's the day that they occupied Zuccotti Park. So this is where I am. I'm, I'm at this business school. At, I'm not that interested in business at first. I mean, I'm always interested in learning new things, but you know, I study morality and politics. And as everybody always says to me, oh, business ethics, isn't that an oxymoron? It's sort of a dumb joke and there's, you know, like, so, you know, so, but this changes things. Suddenly, the whole country is talking about capitalism and the whole culture war reorients itself from abortion and gay marriage to capitalism, minimum wage, inequality. These become the major issues that are dividing us. And it's not just in America. This is similar protests in London. This is Paris. Um, inequality, everybody starts, uh, talk, inequality becomes the central issue that people talk about. This is the sort of graph showing that the top 1% have reaped all the gains, just about all the gains since uh, 1979. Um, President Obama uh, starts saying that inequality is the defining issue of our time. Uh, the uh, um, many intellectuals and people on the left are basically saying that capitalism is broken. Everybody's thinking, what's the next kind of capitalism? This kind is not working. So this is the background um, that uh, when Stern then offered me a full-time position, they said, would you like to join the faculty? And I had to think, do I want to leave a department of psychology forever? And become a professor in a business school? And it would never have occurred to me, but suddenly I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. And this stuff really, really matters. And this is a puzzle. And if I didn't know anything about this till the age of 48, I bet a lot of people don't know anything about this. And this is something good to study. So, um, uh, so the, basic, the basic argument of Occupy Wall Street and, and certain groups on the, on the left is that capitalism is like a vampire squid wrapping its tentacles around the face of humanity, stuffing its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Okay, that's a rough paraphrase of a quote from an article in Rolling Stone magazine. I didn't make that up. But the image of the vampire squid is a good image for one story about capitalism. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, so I visit Occupy Wall Street a number of times, but every time I come back to the business school and I attend any sort of event, there's our dean, Peter Henry, talking about creating value. And everybody talks about creating value. And when you're new to any institution, and especially the US military or a business school, there are a lot of buzzwords, like creating value. And I didn't pay much attention. I thought it's just a buzzword. Um, but then I thought, well, let me learn more about capitalism. And I, I uh, bought a set of lectures from Professor Jerry Muller, Mueller, I'm sorry, his name is Mueller who had written a book that was very influential on me when I was trying to understand conservatism. So I read this, uh, I, I listened to these lectures on capitalism and it just opened, it just, it was just so amazed at what capitalism has done to transform life on earth. Um, so here's a quote from Voltaire. In the 18th century, uh, Voltaire, you know, French intellectual, goes to the, London, uh, the center of, of early capitalism, goes to the stock exchange, and he says, there you will see representatives from all nations gather together for the utility of men. Here, Jew, Mohammedan, and Christian deal with each other as though they were all of the same faith and only apply the word infidel to people who go bankrupt. Well, that's pretty interesting <laughs> that capitalism is a way to foster world peace and cooperation. As long as you don't go bankrupt, it doesn't matter what God you worship. <clears throat> um, Thomas Paine, the American essayist, described capitalism as a pacific system, pacific meaning peaceful or peacemaking. It's a pacifying system operating to cordialize mankind, to make people more cordial, more friendly, uh, by rendering nations as well as individuals useful to each other. There are many quotes from Adam Smith along this, these lines too, that when everybody's trying to sell either themselves as a laborer or sell their products, you have to be nice. It used to be if you want stuff, you can just kill someone and take their stuff, but not anymore. With trade, you can't do that anymore. Um, so I'm reading these, I'm, I'm listening to these lectures, I'm learning about the incredible transformation in Europe in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, um, and then I come across this graph. And this, I think, is the most important graph in human history. Let me walk you through it. This shows GDP in, uh, per capita in constant 1990 dollars from the year one through 1800. And what you can see here is that if this is $5,000 GDP per capita per year, what this means is that everybody on Earth just about was living on about a dollar a day. It's about $400 per year, GDP divided by the population. Um, and uh, until about 1500, when the Europeans 
develop long distance shipping and the uh, 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 British East India Company, Dutch East India Company, that comes a little bit later, but the point is they first, they identify not just ships, but they, they develop some financial technologies that allow merchants to pool their capital and, and, and their risk to send ships to the Orient. This is the birth of mercantile capitalism, trading. They don't make anything, nobody is making anything. But if you imagine a boatload of cinnamon and cardamom sitting on a, on, a, uh, on a dock in Jakarta, or I don't know if Jakarta's on the water, but whatever, sitting on somewhere in the Spice Islands, and then you send a ship there and you bring that whole boatload to London, that suddenly you've created value in that cinnamon is, a, you know, it's a dime a pound in Indonesia, but it's worth millions in London. It's a new spice. So just by moving stuff, the Europeans double or triple their standard of living. And right here, you can see the point at which Europe fate is sealed as the dominant, er, the dominant worldly power for the next five centuries. At this point, China is, if anything, more powerful than Europe, but by getting mercantile capitalism, Europe shoots way ahead of China and the rest of the world. But that's nothing compared to the development of industrial capitalism. So once the Europeans, the D British first, figure out how to make stuff, how to use water power and coal to make stuff in vast quantities cheaply, that changes everything. And actually, it's the USA that, that first masters the art form. And so um, per capita income in the USA skyrockets way above that of Western Europe even. And this goes up to 1950. And this is why the 20th century was the American century, because America mastered industrial capitalism, created the first middle class uh, prosperity on earth in human history, changed the course of history. Um, but even this is nothing up to 1950 compared to what happened. If you go from 1800 to 1950, 150 years, look how far America and Europe came, but that's nothing compared to the 50 years after that. Because as you master industrial capitalism and you make things cheaper and cheaper and better and better, you're creating so much value that you lift everybody up. So Japan follows suit very quickly, uh, equal to Western Europe. Uh, and this graph, this data set happens to end in 2001, but we all know that China and India, uh, and then uh, Africa to some extent too, certain countries, are on that trajectory. So this is what's happening. So I see all this, and then you compare this. I spent in the spring, this spring I went to, uh, uh, eight, I spent three months in Asia. Compare that to the history of, uh, modern history of China. So when Mao Zedong, when the revolution is over, they've won, the communists come in, GDP per capita is, is like nothing in China, it's very poor. And uh, Mao tries the great leap forward and that has no effect on GDP. Um, uh, and then they do the cultural revolution and that has basically no effect. Uh, and then Deng Xiaoping says, poverty is not socialism. And they try something new. They allow a little bit of free trade in Shenzhen in, the, in southern China and look what happens. It works and they let it go and now we have a completely different world order in which China is back. You know, 5,000 year, year culture basically disappeared uh, for, uh, for a few decades. It was an unimportant country for a few decades, uh, but it's back thanks to, thanks to this. You can see it from outer space. You can see the transformative power of capitalism from outer space. In 1950, North Korea, South Korea, they're divided. Uh, they are no different from each other. Same people, same culture, same wealth, same industrial base. Um, but now, if you look at it from outer space, um, there's a rather large difference. In the social sciences, this is what we call a very, very, very large effect size with a very, very, very small p-value. This could not have happened just by random distribution of light bulbs. Um, so, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, and it's not just that it makes money for the rich. As you are lifting uh, up average wealth, you're actually decimating poverty. So in, 19, in 1820, 95% of the human population, it's estimated in this data set, 95% of all people on Earth were living in extreme poverty. Basically, it's near starvation level. Um, and as the Industrial Revolution progresses, uh, this begins to drop in, entirely because Europe, begins, Europe and the West begin to drop. Um, but as uh, industrial capitalism and trade spread around the world, after the Second World War, the drop speeds up. It's plummeting now. Poverty has been plummeting around the world for decades now. And it's estimated that we, while we won't reach zero, we're going to be in single digits within 10 or 20 years. And this is just stunning. So the point is, 
um, that capitalism doesn't just make the rich rich, it also reduces poverty and it also increases happiness. This is a map of how happy people are on average in each country. Uh, and actually as a first approximation, it's a measure of GDP or GDP per capita. Latin America is always happier than its wealth would predict because of certain aspects of Latin American culture. It's very sociable. But otherwise, this is GDP really actually matters for human happiness. So, um, I'm sorry, whoops, the, so um, to sum up, what should we make of capitalism? Is it a vampire squid um, or is it something else? I just Googled, if you just Google capitalism uh, for an image search, this is one image I found which I kind of like here. So it's uh, this, it's capitalism, it just works. Um, <laughs> um, so which, which is it and how can they both be true? Well, they can both be true. There are elements, th they each tell a different story and both of those stories are true in many, many ways. And the reason why they, these stories are true for so many people and they are mutually unintelligible is because America is becoming increasingly divided left, right, and a big part of that divide is over capitalism. So this is Pew data, the Pew Research Center. Um, they surveyed Americans and those who said that they were both liberal and Democrat, which increasingly are the same thing. Um, they are ambivalent about capitalism, whereas people who say they're conservative and Republican are 66% positive. So conservatives are very positive about capitalism, the word, the concept. Um, liberals in this country are evenly split, they're ambivalent. If we look at the word socialism, there it's the reverse. Conservatives really hate the word socialism and people on the left actually like it and they like it more than they like capitalism. So we're very divided as a country. And and when I saw this, when I started looking at how people think about capitalism, what I realized is that we are devolving into two separate worlds. Left and right in this country live in different worlds. We have different climate science, we have a different US constitution, we have a different US history, we live in different worlds. And as a social psychologist who studies morality, this really interests me. My favorite quote in all of the social sciences is this line from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz, who wrote, that uh, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has spun. That's what's really unique about us. It's not that we have two legs or bipedal you know, or you know, vi vision. It's that we have this ability to create cultural webs. We can manufacture meaning out of nothing and then we live in it. And that becomes our world. And so we've made two separate worlds um, and they both have very, very different stories to tell about capitalism. Basically, what Geertz is saying, and he wrote this before any of the Matrix movies or novels, um, is that we, we live in the Matrix. Uh, those of you who've seen the Matrix movies, the Matrix is a consensual hallucination. The left lives in one consensual hallucination, the right lives in another consensual hallucination. They both can see certain aspects of reality, but not other aspects of reality. And as I spent more time at Stern and began studying capitalism and began talking about it, this, I began to see two very clear storylines, and I decided it would be fun to, to animate them, to actually turn them into videos. So I created, I, I hired a video company, I wrote the script, and I'll just show you um, two stories about capitalism. I'd like you to just watch them, listen to them, and just see which one resonates with you, which one feels true or right. Here's the first. Once upon a time, work was real and authentic. Farmers raised crops, and craftsmen made goods with their own hands. But then, capitalism was invented and darkness spread across the land as the smokestacks of the Industrial Revolution covered everything in soot. The capitalists became ever more skilled at extracting productivity from workers and pocketing the gains from their labor. The workers eventually fought back by unionizing. In the early 20th century, as the brutality and stupidity of capitalism were exposed, many governments granted workers some protection from the predators. Democratic welfare states were born. But the capitalists and their right-wing cronies were unrelenting. And in many countries, they have destroyed the unions, slashed regulations, and given the corporations free reign to exploit at will. So, the rich get richer, the rest of us get poorer, our democracy gets weaker, and the planet gets hotter. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight against global capitalism and the super predators it has unleashed upon us. Okay, so that's a coherent story, right? That all makes sense. Okay, now let's have a different story. 
And you'll notice that this second story has exactly the same structure. I wrote out, before I wrote the text, I wrote out the story structure with different slots, and all I did is change the content in the slots, but they're identical in their overall structure. Once upon a time, almost everyone was a peasant, a serf, or a slave. Kings and feudal lords took most of what people produced, so nobody had much reason to work hard. But then, in the 17th century, capitalism was invented and the liberation began. In England, Holland, and America, they discovered that when you give people property rights, the rule of law, and free markets, you turn on a switch in their hearts. People want to work when they can keep the fruits of their labor. They want to invent new products, provide for their children, and be useful to others. Free market capitalism enables them to do these things. In the 20th century, some countries embraced communism and centralized planning, always with the same result. Shortages of everything, including food and freedom. But countries that embraced capitalism have grown prosperous in a single generation. Yet, despite the evidence of history, the left-wing egalitarians are unrelenting. And whenever they get control of a government, their first target is economic freedom. The egalitarians don't want to live in a world in which people who create more value for others get to enjoy more wealth for themselves. They'd rather that everyone be equal and equally poor. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight to protect capitalism and to extend its blessings to all of humankind. Okay, so they're cartoons, but which cartoon do you like better? Uh, let's, let's, let's vote on it in this way. Uh, I'd like to know whether everybody in this room, whether you, are on, you say you're on the left or the right or libertarian. Some people won't fit into any of those. But, so raise your hand if you'd say you're on the left politically. Okay, uh, wow, less than half. That never happens at a university. Um, <laughs> okay, so just those of you who are on the left politically, um, raise your hand if you preferred, if you thought was more true, the first story, the, the exploitation story. Raise your hand. Okay, and th just those of you on the left, raise your hand if you thought the second story was more true. The, the, okay, so, uh, so the left is split 50-50. Those who are on the left are split 50-50 between the two stories. Um, now actually, those of you who are on the right or libertarian, it, I know the answer, so you guys can answer together. Um, <laughs> so, no, no, but wait, I'm sorry, we want to know. Okay, first raise your hand if, you're li if, you, if you'd say you're on the right, you're conservative. Please raise your hand high. Okay, so that, that you got that uh, more than the li liberals. And please raise your hand high if you're a libertarian. Okay, so actually this group's pretty well divided up. Conservatives are the largest group, but it's actually reasonably divided among the three. So conservatives and libertarians, raise your hand if you thought that the first story, the exploitation story, resonated more, that was more true. Raise your hand high. One, two. And raise your hand high if you thought the liberation story was more true. Okay, so that's a statistically significant difference. Um, again, the left is split, but the right is very, you know, yes, capitalism is liberation. It is not exploitation. So, um, so this is what's going on. We have different understandings of what it means, uh, what capitalism is, what it means, what its moral uh, meaning and value is, and that's what makes it so hard for us to do good economic policy in this country. At least it's very open to demagogues and people saying silly things about the economy or policy um, because we, we have these very, very different ideas. So, um, okay, so in the rest of my talk, I'm going to now just very briefly talk about uh, what has happened, what is capitalism done to us? How does it change the world? How does it change our society and other societies? When we unleashed the genie, when, it, when the British originally, uh, and then the Dutch and America, you know, when, when we unleashed this new form of social and economic organization, how did it change us? And I'll just, I'll very briefly go through seven such changes. There are like 10 or 15 more that I could tell you about, but these are the seven that I think are really interesting and easy to convey. So, uh, the first three I've already mentioned. So the first is that it divides us and confounds our thinking. Now here, even though most of what I say about capitalism is going to be positive, um, I really want to make it clear that the, the, the way to think about this, as with almost everything in our politics, is it's a yin-yang sort of thing. Um, so the left, what I find internationally, is that wherever you go, uh, whatever the parties are on the left, they're focused on treating the workers decently. They're focused on not exploiting children, women, immigrants, uh, the environment. So the left always stands for decency, and they're willing to sometimes compromise dynamism to get it. 
but the right always stands for dynamism. They say, let her rip, let, you know, unleash productivity, creativity, and yeah, some people will get hurt along the way, but overall, that's the fastest way to make everyone better off. And so it really is a yin-yang sort of thing. You can't, you could, I mean, just imagine if you had a society that only cared about one or the other and didn't give a, didn't give a darn about the, I mean, that would be inhumane or it would be um, sterile and dead if you didn't care about that. So, so we need both. We need, we are all um, incredibly biased, um, illogical. We do motivated reasoning. We can't think straight about emotional issues. We kind of, we need the opposition of left and right is my view that I developed in The Righteous Mind. Um, number two, capitalism indisputably makes people, makes societies richer, so I showed you this graph. I mean, the effect is just so transformative, so gigantic. Um, and as I said, it's not just that the rich get richer, it actually eliminates or it greatly reduces poverty. Um, so that's a very strong point in its favor. And then the question becomes what kind of capitalism, not whether we should have capitalism. Um, third, it doesn't just make people rich but unhappy and empty, which is a long critique on the left of commercial society and consumerism. Um, the the uh, UN has commissioned a series of reports, some really superb economists, uh, John Hallowell, Richard Layer, Jeffrey Sachs work together. Economists generally or traditionally didn't understand um, psychology or human beings, they just did numbers. But recently, I'm sorry, I'm sure there are a lot of economists in the audience, but recently eco economics has gotten much more psychological and there's a really good psychology in these reports. They've analyzed uh, Gallup data and other data and they've come to, they're wonderful reports, just Google these, they're really insightful about how our world is changing and if you care about public policy, how economists can make policies that will not just boost income, but will make people happier. One of their findings, this is a map from their work, um, is, as I said, uh, that GDP actually matters. So this is the ranking of happiness by survey data. And what you see is that the Scandinavian, so the top ranks Switzerland, uh, and then Scandinavia, so it's Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Canada, Finland, Netherlands, Sweden, New Zealand, Australia, Israel, Costa Rica, Austria, Mexico, United States is 15. Um, so it's dominated by Scandinavia and the Anglosphere. Something about British countries, British institutions, and Scandinavians seem to have gotten something right. Now the US has a variety of issues, that's why we're not on top on most measures on average, but we're doing, at 15, we're doing pretty well. Small countries tend to do better than big countries, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, anyway, what they do, uh, these World Bank econ these uh, uh, UN economists, um, is they break down the average rating into components that are attributable to country level factors. And so the blue represents the percentage of the effect that can be attributed to GDP per capita. And that's the largest single piece. Um, but, set, but it's not much larger than the orange is how much of this is explained by social support, life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, corruption. So, there, it's really a great piece of work where they show you what is it that leads countries to flourish, to feel that their people, the people feel they're doing well. And they summarize it, it's the, the, if you have this constellation of factors, if your country is wealthy, free, has good rule of law and a good safety net, that's the recipe for a great country where people are satisfied and happy. And so all the countries here have that to varying degrees, whereas if we look at the bottom, uh, Togo, Burundi, Syria, Benin, Rwanda, Afghanistan. So these are countries, especially in Africa and the, and the Muslim world, especially countries that suffer from war, civil war. Um, but these countries here have almost none of those, of those factors that I mentioned. So the effects are gigantic. The effects uh, of, of uh, these institutions and of, of capitalism with a safety net are very, very powerful. Fourth effect, um, capitalism, um, or commerce, I should say, but capitalism uh, promotes it, um, does make us less violent. The speculation, there's 18th century speculations about how it turns us all into salesmen, that where we have to be nice in order to get people to buy from us. Um, so Steve Pinker wrote a very important book a few years ago called The Better Angels of Our, uh, the Better Angels of Our Nature, in which he documents that violence was in, in traditional societies, in hunter-gatherer societies, uh, and in European society uh, until about the 17th or 18th century, violence was ubiquitous. I mean, people would just beat and rob each other. Rape was endemic, uh, cruel punishments by the government. Um, so this is a medieval drawing, and it's just a, it's just a catalog of, of, of horrors. 
And what Pinker did over many years, he gathered together all the information he could find on violence in different societies, and he documents a stunning decline in violence um, as civilization advances. Now this is a logarithmic scale of homicides per 100,000 people. Out of every 100,000 people, how many die each year by murder? This is a logarithmic scale. So uh, traditional societies, hunter-gatherer societies, it's, you know, it's in the ballpark of 100 out of 100,000, so you know, especially for men. So lots and lots of men in particular are murdered every year in pre-state societies. Once you get civilization, um, it drops down, um, uh, and this is data now for Western Europe, so this would be about 30 or so, it's hard to estimate on a log scale, but about 30 per 100,000 in the th 14th century. And it goes down, but as economic development proceeds, as Europe uh, gets wealthier, as capitalism and democracy begin to flourish, um, this, it doesn't look like it's plummeting, but it's going from 30 to one. So murder drops by about 97% in Western Europe. Stunning, stunning, stunning effect. Met several causes, but Pinker cites one of the five or six major causes is commerce. And again, he says, well, you know, when you had a feudal system where you could, you know, groups would, or, or lords would battle each other and you'd have a lot of war to get stuff. Yet if you think about society as a fixed pie, he's got a big piece, I want some of his piece, I'm going to fight him to take some of his piece. But capitalism changes everyone's thinking into a growing pie. And so you, you don't, you're not successful by taking someone else's, you're successful by figuring out a way to grow the pizza pie, as it were. Um, so, um, so that's the fourth point. Capitalism basically makes societies less violent as it uh, hooks them into trade. Uh, fifth point, it leads to inequality of outcomes. This is the, one of the major criticisms of the, of the left, and there's an enormous amount of truth to it. Now, the story is complicated, but it is, I can't imagine a way that a capitalist society could lead to equality. It, it just could not happen that people end up with the same amount of, of resources. Um, so Thomas Piketty, of course, rocketed to, to, to fame and success in the US with his book on inequality. His basic thesis is that whenever the return on capital is higher than the average, which is this purple line, say, you know, four, historically going back to the year zero, roughly he estimates people could make four to five percent on their money um, and with fluctuations. Uh, and this is the rate of growth. And as I showed you, things didn't grow until you get capitalism. So things aren't growing um, until you get capitalism. And then there's this interesting period between, uh, af from the end of the First World War through about 1980, there's this brief period where the rate of growth is skyrocketing and it's actually higher than the return on capital. So this is the great period, the glory period of American capitalism, when all boats were rising and the working class was actually rising faster than the rich. And so this is a very appealing uh, period to people on the left in particular. Um, it's called the Great Compression. There's a so you have very high, this is the share of the uh, top Let's see, the share of top decile in national income. This is how much the, t the top 10%, the richest 10%, what percentage of national income do they take home every year? And historically, or the 19, in the early 1900s, it was about 40 to 50%, and then you get the Great, you get the great, well, you get the great Depression, you get the Second World War. Um, you have this long period from the 40s through the 70s where actually the, the top decile doesn't control a vast percentage of the but beginning around, the night, around 1980, that changes, and this is the period where we are now. So the basic argument of, of Piketty and many others um, on the left is that capitalism briefly looked promising as a way to lift all boats, but now it's back to its old tricks. Um, and uh, so how many of you, so of course we know that capitalism makes the rich richer. Um, what do you think it does to the poor? If you, th if you look at the bottom 10% in the 1970s and the bottom 10% now, do you think that the poor have gotten poorer or stayed the same or gotten richer? Raise your hand if you think that the poor have gotten poorer over the last 40 or 50 years. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think they've stayed the same. And raise your hand if, you think the, if they think the poor are richer than they used to be. Okay, so again, this is the most, le most right-wing audience I've ever spoken to at a university. It's not surprising. <laughs> but in any normal department at a university, people would be convinced that the, that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And so many people have seen versions of this graph. This shows the top 1% goes up, the lowest quintile goes down from 1979 to 2007. But here's the point. We are all so biased and partisan, including social scientists, that we pick our assumptions and our graphing techniques to get the story we want. So this graph does show that the poor went down, but that's only if we graph 
their percentage of the income. So it is true that the poor command a smaller percentage of the pie than they used to. But the pie has grown so much that if we actually look at absolute terms, corrected for inflation, of course, but if we look in absolute terms, actually the rich have gotten a lot richer, but the poor have gotten richer too. So uh, this is after, after you uh, take into account the effects of taxes and government transfers. Uh, the, so the top 1% are the ones who've really gone way, way up. That is undeniable. Um, but look, here's the bottom. Here's the bottom uh, 20%. They're 40% better off, inflation adjusted, than they were in 1980. Whereas the top 10%, excluding them, so uh, the, the top 20%, excluding the 1%, is 65. So 65% better off versus 40% better off. That's not so bad. Everyone's getting richer, and the rich are just a little bit richer. But the very rich, wow, they are a lot richer. And there's a lot of reasons for that, especially globalization, winner take all. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. We could, we could talk about that later. Um, but my point is that facts increasingly, as we get more and more polarized, facts depend on your politics. And this is true for social scientists, as it is for lawyers, as it is for, every, for everyone. So um, is inequality rising rapidly or very slowly? I can't tell, because when I listen to economists on both sides, like they can both make their case. Um, <clears throat> if it's rising, is it due to various macro trends, or is it due to corruption and crony capitalism? Um, does inequality foster all these terrible uh, uh, outcomes, as Wilson and Pickett and other scholars maintain on the left? Um, or others on the right say, no, actually, it's, it's, it's not very pernicious, and it fosters more innovation. Would raising the minimum wage reduce inequality? Well, that depends on your politics. Economists don't agree on basic facts, like how big is the disemployment effect of raising the cost of, of uh, unskilled labor. So this is a very serious problem for us as a country. Our experts don't agree on basic facts. So I hope those of you who do go into any sort of policy analysis, you'll take this with you. Some humility about the fact that our politics biases our research. Um, sixth point, capitalism changes our values and it's bringing us into ways of living that people have never lived in before. We don't know what's gonna happen. It's exciting in some ways, but it really is uncharted territory. Let me explain. Um, there's a really important data set called the World Value Survey. It began in Europe. They surveyed a bunch of people in about 20 uh, European countries. Um, but they quickly realized, wow, this is powerful stuff. They expanded it globally. Um, it's now up to 95 countries. About every six or seven years, they collect data uh, from about 1,500 or 2,000 people in each country. So they have a snapshot of the world's values over several decades. And we can see how things change. It's really an extraordinary data set. It's all available online. Just Google it. You can download the data yourself. What they find is that if they graph each country, to just take the average score for each country on their questions about uh, the role of women or religion or democracy or capitalism or freedom, everything, and you do a, a, a multi-dimensional scaling, a statistical procedure to just put countries together that have similar responses, here's what you get. Um, <clears throat> so what this is, I'll just, you can't read the na country names, but um, down here in the bottom left, we have the, the African and Muslim nations. Uh, up in the upper right, we have the Scandinavian countries, Protestant Europe. Um, the US is actually over here, and the English-speaking countries are over here. The Chinese countries, the Confucian countries are up here. So what does this all mean? The way that, they, that the authors interpret these two axes is as follows. <clears throat> um, there's the, the horizontal axis is the most important one. When life is dangerous and you can't count on your retirement savings. In fact, you might be dead tomorrow if you know, hordes of barbarians sweep in from the steppes and take everything, as was the case for much for human civilizations for thousands of years. You're just focused on survival. Um, you don't care very much about personal freedoms. You just want to uh, uh, keep yourself safe. If you have some money, you're gonna bury it in the backyard. Um, uh, uh, so that's, uh, whereas when things are safer, then suddenly people start caring about freedom. They have more emancipative values. They want democracy, they want rights. They begin to care about the environment, about equality, about human rights. Um, the other dimension is uh, traditional to secular rational. Traditional is religious, um, uh, oriented towards the past. Secular rational, you begin to, st you, you stop doing so much ritual because ritual is very time consuming. So to, the best way to think about it is like this. Um, countries don't just go from the bottom left to the upper right, rather, what world history has been is a movement in two steps. So start here. 
all countries just about were agricultural. Agricultural societies tend to be very religious. They have traditional values. You have to do things in an orderly way, the way our ancestors did them. Uh, so you have traditional values and you're always subject to drought, to invading armies. So it's, life is dangerous. Um, so the values of agricultural societies tend to be in this quadrant. But once you get industrial capitalism and people leave the countryside and go into the factories, that's what happened in England in the, 18th, in the 19th century, um, and that's what's happening in China in the last 30 or 40 years. As everybody was moving to the cities and moving into the factories, you get a transition from agriculture to industry and you get what are called materialist values. They put aside religion, everybody wants money. Money, money, money. And it's really ugly. Um, I spent three months traveling across Asia, and as far as I can tell, um, um, if you just go to the big cities in Asia, it seems like you know, they're owned by Louis Vuitton and, and uh, 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 you know, Henry Bendel. I don't even know, I mean, there's like, I didn't know that there were so many luxury brands in the world, but they're in every, like, every street corner, uh, in, you know, in, in Singapore, in Shanghai, and in, in Kuala Lumpur. Um, it's really materialist. And this has always bothered people on the left and artists about what capitalism does. It creates this fever for luxury goods and people work and work and work to buy extravagant, useless objects. So I think it's this move that gives capitalism a bad name all around the world because this is kind of ugly. But if you just wait a couple generations, or now in Asia, one generation, what happens is you get a transition from industrial to a service economy. And now, what virtues and values do you need? It's not just about fit into the machine, show up on time, do the same thing over and over again. It's now, okay, you're the sales manager for this new brand. What are you gonna do? And you have to know how to deal with people. You have to be friendly, you have to know psychology. So the values change, um, and you get what they call post-materialist values. And here's their wonderful summary of it. This is a great book that I'm reading now by one of the authors, Christian Wilson. When you have prosperity and security, you get what they call these emancipatory values. You get a movement to the right on that graph. And here's the, here's the great quote. Fading existential pressures, that is, you're not afraid of dying anymore. You're not afraid of war and famine. When, that, when those pressures fade, it opens people's minds. It makes them prioritize freedom over security, autonomy over authority, diversity over uniformity, and creativity over discipline. People also become more trusting, happier, as you saw in that, in that world, the, 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 those, gra those uh, maps. So this I found in my trip across Asia, boy, this theory just worked so well to explain what is going on. So I was especially in a lot of the, the Chinese, Confucian countries, so here's what's happened. So um, you know, everybody wanted to know, like in Korea and China and Hong Kong, like what's happening to us? How, are, how is our country changing? And the general trajectory is like this. Japan is so amazing. Japan industrialized more than a century before anyone else in Asia. I mean, they were a closed society, and the instant they were opened up uh, by Admiral Perry and the, you know, the US Navy, it's like the instant they were opened up, they figured out how to do industrialism. They had railroads. So Japan is way ahead of the rest of Asia in its industrialization. And sure enough, you know, look where they are. They're on their way to becoming Sweden in terms of their values. And is that what's going to happen to all these countries? We don't know. I can say for sure they're going to move to the right on this graph. And I can say that in part because that's what they themselves say. Everywhere I went in Asia, I saw the biggest generation gap, vastly larger than what we had in this country in the 60s between the baby boomers and their, kid, uh, and their parents. So for example, um, a Korean economics professor, he said, well, there are three generations of students. Uh, those born in the 70s, they were influenced by the struggle against the authoritarian regime, the military dictatorship in the 80s. Um, and the, those born in the 80s, they were raised without existential pressures. Uh, they're the ones who really wanted more freedom, uh, more individualism. Um, and then he says, those born in the 90s, I have not figured them out yet. They are not Korean. <laughs> and I saw this everywhere. The young people, they, they don't make any sense. Where did, they, where did these little monsters come from? And it wasn't always little monsters. I mean, it was always mixed, you know, praise and fear but they don't have the values of our parents and our culture. Conversely, a Korean woman, age 24, one of these little monsters, said, well, most older people, they don't want change. They want to keep things as they are. They have a fear of change. My generation, they want to make change. They want to make a new kind of society. 
So this is playing out all over the world because of capitalism and the very rapid changes that it makes to the material circumstances and emotional circumstances of childhood. My last point, because of these changes, we as a planet, as a species, we are now confronted with what you might call the $100 trillion question. And it goes like this. So this is a graph of total uh, gross world product. What's the total value of all stuff on Earth? And back in the 1950s, this estimate puts it at less than $10 trillion, but it's, you know, it's going up and up and up. Here was a, there was a recession in the, you know, in the early 80s. Um, here's the global financial crisis there. Wasn't that a disaster? Uh, tiny little blip on the way up. So this is where we are in, 20, in 2012, that's the, as far as that data goes. Um, but what that means is that we will pretty soon, in you know, another decade or two, we'll be at $100 trillion of total value. And population is gonna begin to drop everywhere outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. It's gonna drop, um, we're gonna have a big crash of population uh, in the end of this century, and Africa is estimated that will be a few decades behind, but it's gonna happen there too. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what do we want our countries to look like? What's the point of all this money? Well, the United States was the first society in history to face this question. And the affluence of the 1950s, the post-war boom, uh, led to people asking, is that all there is? What are we, what are we doing? Um, sure, we've got all these great cars, we've got all these material comforts. The lives of women were transformed when they didn't have to spend all day doing laundry at the, at the stream and beating the laundry on the rocks. Um, they had appliances, they had labor-saving devices. Um, they have high fashion kitchen, kitchens. Um, and I, I think the most beautiful and, and really provocative statement of this comes from Robert Kennedy uh, in a speech he gave just a month or two before he was assassinated. He said, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. He said, it measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And so that's our challenge. We've solved the material problems. We've solved most of the medical problems. We have very safe, long lives. What more do we want? And that's the $100 trillion question, I think. What is a flourishing capitalist society in the 21st century? Each country and each generation is gonna have its own answer. And I'm hopeful that a center such as this one will foster thinking about that. I'll just close with one of the best ideas I've encountered as I've been writing and learning about capitalism. A libertarian philosopher, David Schmitz, gave a talk at NYU, and he just had this line. He said, well, at its best, a free market society is a game that you can only win by making other people better off. And it was so simple, and it just really struck me. Really, wow, it's that, it's that simple? And, and I asked him about this later, like a year later I met him and he doesn't even remember saying it, but he said, yeah, it sounds like something I might have said. Um, but, <laughs> um, but it's really, it's really brilliant in its simplicity because before capitalism, the way to get rich and powerful is to kill other people and take their stuff, but not anymore. I heard, I, was, I gave a talk in Korea at a conference, uh, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, one of the richest men in China, um, he said something very similar. He said, the secret of success is help others. Now, it's a beautiful thought, and it's an aspiration. That's where we want to go. If we get to a society where the only way to win the game is to make other people better off, then as far as I'm concerned, we have ethical capitalism. Now, are we there yet? Let me show you the car I bought four weeks ago. And I bought it precisely because, precisely because it had everything. I couldn't believe that you could get everything in one package. So we are not yet. Um, I mean, this isn't literally my car, but I bought that model in white. <clears throat> um, so we're not there yet. Um, it is still the case that you can get ahead in a lot of ways by making other people worse off. Now then, that's why you need government regulators, you need the EPA, the Europeans couldn't do it themselves, they were too corrupt. So the whole game, you know, what's the role of government, crony capital, I mean, it's complicated. And those who just worship free market capitalism and think there should be no role for government, I don't agree with them either. It's complicated, it's yin-yang. And that's basically what I wanna leave you with. Um, I hope this talk uh, and your studies here at Louisville and your participation in the activities of the center 
will help you think in more nuanced ways about capitalism. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Nat. Love a wonderful presentation. Two Thank things. you, Nat. One, I used to believe Frank Fukuyama's uh, end of history. Uh, yeah. End of history. Yeah. I've given up on that, and I suspect you have too. And so what I would like yeah. to say, right? you know, yeah. I'm not sure. Liberal, yeah. That liberal democracies would be where all those countries would go. Yeah. Right? So here's the question I have for you. Let's go out and look at capitalism 20 years out. Okay. So now we've got this amazing artificial intelligence. Yeah. It's disrupting everything. Yep. So we have the Oscar report, which says that about 47% of the jobs that humans now do <coughs> may mm -hmm. be automated. Right. Which is a game changer in human history, threatens capitalism. What's your take on that? Yeah, so first about the end of history argument. For those who don't know it, this was an argument from Frank Fukuyama in 1989 after the Berlin Wall fell and repeated in a book in 1992 that communism has failed, the only viable model is liberal democratic societies, and so we have the end of history in that ultimately all countries are gonna end up at Denmark. That's his phrase, getting to Denmark. And it sure looked that way in the 90s. And boy, it does not look that way now. The liberal democratic societies are all sclerotic, they are, uh, they are divided by partisanship. They're not very good role models. When I was in Asia, lots of people say they want to be like Scandinavia, but man, not like the US. What a joke we are. Our government shuts down. Um, so, um, um, so yes, it looks as though he was wrong. On the other hand, he might have been right in that if you buy this view, and I do, that all of these countries will eventually move this way, then you kind of come back to Fukuyama's point that even if it takes 100 years, eventually everyone's going to care about women's rights, gay rights, individualism, rule of law. So we might still get there. We just don't know. And one of the big factors is just what you pointed to. Will it be the same as it ever was where creative destruction wipes out most of the jobs? I mean, look at it. If you go back to 1900 and then you go to 1950, what percentage of the jobs in 1900, mostly farming, were gone by 1950? I don't know the percentage. Maybe this time it's scary, but maybe it'll be just like it always was. But maybe it won't. And AI does scare me in that respect because you know, there always were jobs for manual laborers and there may not be in the future. So I don't know what's gonna, I don't know. But that's, that's the question that our younger people are gonna have to figure out. Okay, in the back row, yes. Hi, um, could you pull up the GDP graph that you said is the most important graph of sure. the industry? Yep. Um, if you can please address a couple of points Mm -hmm. um, so this takeoff in value, it coincides yeah. with slavery, colonialism, and mm -hmm. worldwide just destruction. Um, mm -hmm. The extirpation of the indigenous and the Americas yeah. and um, the enslavement of millions of mm -hmm. Africans. Um, so this idea that it leads to prosperity is on mm -hmm. the backs of those enslaved individuals mm -hmm. and communities. Yeah. So could you please address the role of racism mm -hmm. and making us more prosperous and happy um, and how capitalism and racism, um, I guess, uh, in your opinion, is capitalism can overcome racism? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's because you put your finger on one of the current debates about the moral status of capitalism and it's a straight culture war question because historians on the left have made that case in a couple of recent books, Empire of Cotton, and the stories they, oh my God, we had one of, uh, Baptiste, we had, uh, I forget his first name, Baptiste spoke at NYU, and the way he described, I mean, he did you know, ethnography of southern slaveholders, and the way they calculated ways to maximize production, it, it, I mean, you know, the, the, the African, the enslaved people, they were cogs in the wheel, and if whipping them harder would do it, then we do it. I mean, it was, it was the complete dehumanization and brutalization. And so historians on the left often think that without that cheap cotton, the mills of Manchester would not have gotten going. And historians on the right say, no, yes, it happened, but if it hadn't been the cheap cotton from there, the cotton would have been a little more expensive, but it still would have happened. I, I'm not a historian, I don't know the truth. What I can say is that even if the Western story did involve the massive exploitation of, of, of non-white people, 
um, especially in the Americas, taken from Africa, even if that was part of the Western story, I don't think it's essential to capitalism because look what's happening in Asia. It didn't require that there. I mean, Singapore didn't require, they do have a lot of low wage labor and that we could talk about sweatshops are, are different from slavery. Um, so um, what I would say is I don't think it's essential, but I think it is part of the dirty underside that capitalism promotes a mindset in business people of ruthlessly or doing anything you can to get revenue up and costs down. And in the process of thinking that way, ethics fades away. Thank you. I have a really quick follow-up question. Okay. Uh, that Robert Kennedy quote, yes. like with this graph, it doesn't measure dead land, dead water, mm -hmm. how we're, the, the unhappiness of not only human beings, but ecosystems. So yes. Be so here we have, right. So. So here we have what's called the Kuznets curve, because that's, so if you look at the most polluted places on earth, none of them are in capitalist societies. They're in Russia, they're in uh, Middle Eastern societies. Um, so both for the slavery issue and the environmentalism issue, I can say the same thing. Um, early in the process of industrialization, people don't care about human rights. They don't care about the environment. And that's what we see in China. I mean, they really, you know, prosperity, you know, prosperity at any cost. We don't care about the air but then their children really do, and their grandchildren really, really do. Same thing with slavery. Slavery ended because of moral objections among the British. Now the British of, of, the eight, of, of 1700 probably didn't care very much, but by the early 1800s, they really did care. So this process of as capitalism makes people richer, they get these emancipative values, and then they say, what the hell are we doing? What are we doing to Africans? What are we doing to the environment? So that's one of the central and interesting and I think wonderful contradictions of capitalism is that early on, yes, you can link it to environmental destruction and racism and slavery, but by its very nature, it changes people's values so that then they renounce it. And ultimately we're all better off, but yeah, there's some awfulness along the way. Just bear in mind, there was awfulness everywhere all along the way, whether you were capitalist or not. So it's not as though, it's not as though people were noble savages or peaceful and then suddenly capitalism made them brutal. So it's, it's, it's complicated. Okay, yes? Why the tick up and the murder Excuse me? Why the tick up and the murder um, I believe that's from leaded gasoline. Seriously, we, we dumped hundreds of millions of tons of lead into the air, and lead is the biggest disruptor of neural development, and so crime rates skyrocket um, uh, 20 years later, and so post-war America, everyone, all the kids become lead poisoned, especially in cities, so we get a huge rise in crime in the cities, um, and then when you, New York City bans leaded gas in 1977, um, crime begins to plummet a year before Giuliani gets into office, but everybody thinks, oh, it must be Giuliani. <laughs> and then three years later, it plummets everywhere else in the country because New York banned lead three years before everybody else. So, you know, this is not settled, but I believe after reading about this, I believe leaded gas caused this incredible tick up and now it's plummeted and nobody knows why. Leaded gas is the only thing that explains the up and the down. Uh, let's see, any students? Uh, are there students with questions? Okay, yes. Uh, you did a lot of studies on uh, developed societies. Mm -hmm. uh, in post-materialist societies as well. I was wondering if you've done the, um, I should say, pre-materials, like the uh, Amish communities, for example, mm -hmm. and how the communities interact with one another. How they what? Interact with, within their society and, and yeah. their relations. Yeah, um, I've done very little of that. I did spend three months doing research in India um, when I was a postdoc. Um, for this book, I'm not, I don't, because I have kids at home, I don't have time, I'd love to go everywhere, but I'm focusing on societies that are good models for capitalism in the future. So I'm not looking at pre-industrial societies for this book. Um, obviously, this is one of the issues that traditional societies all face is the destruction of their old ways because no matter what they do, their kids want Levi's and Walkmen. That's what it was when I was you know, in the 80s. Now it's iPhones and whatever. You know? so, so, these new way so capitalism creates a consumer mindset, which is like a drug. It's seductive. It lures young people away from traditional values. And I don't know how the Amish are coping with it. Um, I don't know how successful they are in, in, in keeping out those lures. But those are all good questions. I just don't know the answer. Okay, do we have time for one? Is that, okay, one more question. Okay, yes, over here. In your analysis, you compare the capitalist and communist. 
Yes. Uh, I have two questions. I would like to know if you consider it that the socialists are capitalist, it's the same. And the second question is, <coughs> what, uh, what would you prefer, socialism or capitalism? Um, so, I, I, you know, I think, sorry, so what's the, you know, there's communism, socialism, capitalism. What, what do I make of socialism? Um, uh, it's a very, it's a term that people use in so many different ways. Um, certainly the, the communist countries all call themselves socialist, and if the key thing is the role, the, the, the degree to which the government controls or regula controls the means of production, um, that's part of the definition of capitalism. If it, the government basically doesn't control the means of production and it lets let it, you know, just let it rip, let, let, let economic freedom, let people decide what to do, that's capitalism. Um, so if that's the dividing line, um, then it becomes a value judgment how much control you want. Um, I think Norway and Alaska give us a nice example of how maybe it makes sense to say that the vast reserves of oil in the ground belong to the people. Why should we just sell those property rights for pennies because of kickbacks <laughs> okay, so, so I think there are examples where I think the, you know, um, the, the, the experience of different countries, the world is now a laboratory, and it really can show us what works. Um, if you'd asked me a year ago about authoritarian capitalism, like China, where it, it's, it's the government controls a lot, we would have said, well, maybe it, maybe it worked pretty well. You know, it's really going up. But of course, it has all kinds of, of inefficiencies, as Hayek and others pointed out. So I think you'd have to look at all the different countries. What I would say is that um, capitalism with no government controls, constraints, regulations is going to have all kinds of problems and brutality and missed opportunities. Um, but because of our ideology, we end up, you know, when you start regulating things, you often end up with all I, I don't know. I've got to figure it out while I write the book, basically. I don't know yet. So, okay. Thank you very much for your attention.